Uh, well, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Nate Slater. I'm an AWS solution architect. I work here in San Francisco, uh, covering some of the uh, accounts that we have here in the Bay Area. Tonight, we're going to talk about Amazon Aurora. It's a new database product. It's a relational database. Uh, we announced uh, the product for the first time, I believe, uh, this past year at our reInvent conference, which was uh, in uh, November of 2014 in Las Vegas. It's our annual user conference. Uh, the product today is in uh, beta and will hopefully be going to GA soon. And uh, you know, as many of you who are AWS customers already, um, we can see about possibly getting you early access if you are interested. And I'll have some information at the end uh, about the, the expected launch date for the product. So. So Aurora is a relational database. And before we jump into uh, what Aurora does and what it is, uh, I thought it'd be useful to just sort of take a quick stroll back through history and uh, talk about the history of the database. In the 1970s, uh, we saw the uh, introduction of the mainframe, right? The ma big, big, huge systems that were you know, comfortable in big data centers at uh, corporate headquarters. Uh, that basically ran all of the company's operations and uh, all the database related activity generally was performed on a mainframe. In the 1980s, we started to see the rise of the Unix relational databases, right? There's a lot of companies that I'm sure we're all familiar with that came of age during that period that offer some of the uh, most widely used relational databases today. In the 90s, probably the mid to late 90s, we also started to see uh, x86 architecture uh, make a, a move into the relational database land uh, with some of the uh, uh, products like Microsoft SQL Server and others that uh, didn't require a big Unix server to run. And shortly after that, we started seeing uh, relational databases uh, that came from the open source community, things like MySQL, Postgres. Uh, by sort of mid-2000s, uh, they gone from the point of being databases that were used for very specific purposes to actually running you know, large production workloads. And then in this decade, uh, NoSQL has really been uh, ascendant. Uh, you know, NoSQL has existed for a while, but uh, it's been in the last probably you know, five to seven years that we've really started to see it uh, become a widely used technology. And so, that's just sort of a quick history of, of where we are today with databases. And the relational database has been a cornerstone of IT infrastructure for nearly four decades, right? Anybody who's done any software engineering in the last 30 years has touched a relational database at some point, right? Uh, it offers a lot of really compelling features. Uh, the first is uh, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. You have ACID compliance. Uh, you have atomic transactions you have a consistent schema so that when each transaction commits, uh, the database is in a consistent state. Uh, you have isolation, so you can run a concurrent system where each transaction uh, executes as if it's in complete isolation from every other. Uh, and then finally, you have durability, right? If the database system crashes, you can actually restore your data from the crash. So those are, those are powerful concepts, and uh, NoSQL databases support usually some of them, but not all of them. And uh, there are trade-offs as a result. So you know, these, are, these are things that, that most folks find valuable in a relational database system. Uh, SQL, also a uh, very powerful tool. Uh, very flexible, uh, been around for a long time. Uh, there is a lot of good tooling around it, IDEs and other things. Uh, it's, it's very easy to develop with SQL. Uh, there's a rich eso ecosystem of tools to do almost anything with a database, a relational database. You have tools that let you uh, build uh, logical schema and promote that to a physical schema and then actually generate the DDL for your tables on the database, right? A lot of uh, really, really handy tools that make uh, productivity very, very high when working with a relational database. And they've also been designed to run on the most powerful hardware, right? So unlike some software packages where you can choose to run it on a system that has 16 cores, you may or may not see any noticeable benefit if the system's single-threaded and isn't going to make use of all the resources on that hardware. Databases have always been designed to make extensive use of, of the hardware. So uh, if you invest in an expensive, powerful server and you run a relational database on it, most of the time, at least, it's going to take full advantage of the hardware available to you. The problem, and it's not necessarily a problem, but, but the, the reality is, is that usage has changed over the years. When relational databases were first introduced, um, you really only accessed it through the corporate network, right? And it was usually through terminals, right? You had a 
you know, a couple of people who had terminal access to the database, and that was it. In the 90s, we started to see uh, PCs accessing databases, either directly or indirectly over the internet, right? As websites and other sort of highly scaled applications came of age, all of a sudden now you have not just tens or hundreds of clients accessing the database, you have potentially thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even millions. And uh, you know, some of the uh, uh, work that uh, resulted in products like uh, DynamoDB, which is uh, the AWS NoSQL database, came out of uh, work that had been done at Amazon.com to scale their database, right? So uh, the 90s was really, uh, 90s, late 90s into 2000 was really a period where all of a sudden we were starting to see databases having to serve up a lot more load than they traditionally had previously. And then today, of course, you have a multitude of devices. You have mobile devices, you have laptops, you have smart TVs, tablets, right? Sometimes people have all of these types of devices and they're running them at the same time. Uh, I've got my laptop here, I've got my cell phone in my pocket and my smartphone in my pocket. You know, all of these have apps that ultimately access some sort of database. So this, this has created some problems in scaling. Right, relational databases uh, scale in two different ways, typically. You can scale up or you can scale out. And if you scale up, you end up absorbing quite a bit of cost because to scale up involves adding more hardware, uh, oftentimes proprietary hardware, uh, that's very expensive. If you scale out, meaning you're actually going to add more nodes or more instances using commodity hardware, you can keep your costs lower, but that comes at the price of complexity. You end up with situations where uh, your data is sharded across instances, uh, you have fancy master to master replication going on, all things that create some operational challenges. And so, as this slide points out, uh, when you're scaling vertically, uh, you end up paying uh, a lot more to do it, and when you scale out horizontally, you may be able to do that for less money, but uh, somebody somewhere is gonna have uh, potentially an operational nightmare on their hands if you don't do things properly. So uh, these are just two of the main reasons that scaling a relational database has you know, typically been, been hard. So let's introduce Amazon Aurora, which uh, aims to uh, solve this problem of scaling a database. But before we, we dig in there, it's useful to know where Aurora fits into the AWS data storage ecosystem. We have a number of services that we offer, and all of them sort of do different things uh, and are, are you know, best suited for certain workloads. On the bottom left there, when we're looking at sort of very hot data storage, so data that's very, very recent, uh, oftentimes as in the case of ElastiCache, resident in memory, uh, we have our ElastiCache product, which uh, basically supports Redis and Memcache uh, caching systems. Uh, and it's a very loose schema, right? These are object stores. You store data uh, in sort of key value pair, JSON type uh, notation, and there's not a lot of schema enforcement, right? You can sort of put whatever you want in there. We also have DynamoDB, also very good for hot data, uh, because it can scale uh, to meet demanding read and write IO workloads. Uh, it has maybe a little bit more schema than uh, ElastiCache, but not much, right? At the end of the day, DynamoDB is a key value store. We re recently added support for JSON. So uh, if you're looking for strict relationships between entities, it's gonna be more challenging to do that with a loosely schemed system than it would be with a strong schema system. So obviously, we have to have something in that uh, quadrant, and today we have RDS. RDS uh, runs relational databases such as MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, Oracle, and you have all of the benefits of a relational database in that it's a uh, strong, strict schema, uh, relational model, uh, and you know, adheres to the ACID uh, compliance. We also have Redshift, which is better for cooler data, so data that's maybe a day old, two days old, a month old, you know, data that's not as live. Uh, generally, there's some kind of ETL process to move it from the hotter data storage, like DynamoDB or RDS, uh, into Redshift. Uh, it uses a columnar data uh, storage technique, but it looks and acts to the client application like a relational database. You can execute SQL queries against it, uh, and it has many of the same properties as a relational database, even though under the hood it's actually um, storing data very differently. But it's not great for transactional stuff, right? You wouldn't want to have Redshift be used to ingest data from 
user profile uh, settings on mobile devices, right? It's just not designed for that. We also have S3, great for cold storage, right? You can move data out of systems like Dynamo or even RDS uh, or even Redshift uh, where the cost per gigabyte stored is a little higher. If you want to archive data, you can move it to S3. And for the coldest data storage of all, we have Glacier, which is really offline data. You need it only for regulatory purposes or compliance purposes. You don't expect to have to access it frequently. S3 and Glacier are object stores, so again, you can put whatever you want in there, so there's no real schema, right? Whether you're storing binary data or JSON, doesn't matter, it's going to treat it the same way. <coughs> and then finally, as we'll talk about today, we have Aurora, which is really a relational database, strongly schemed relational database that's designed for very, very low latency. So it, it, it fits a very uh, sort of useful spot uh, in, in the ecosystem in that if you want to use a relational database and you need extremely high performance and performance that scales horizontally, Aurora is a really good choice. So what did we do with Aurora? Well, we, we reinvented relational database using a service-oriented approach and we'll go into some details about what that actually means. Um, the scale out component of the database was really a function of some very interesting things we did with storage, right? So we'll see uh, in the next uh, several slides that it's at the storage layer that a lot of the magic happens with Aurora. And then we retained drop-in compatibility with MySQL 5.6, right? We wanted to give people a, a database that actually their existing apps would work with right out of the box, right? We didn't want to have to have them rewrite queries or, you know, even make subtle changes to the SQL engine that would break existing applications. So we applied some service-oriented architecture to the database, and that really is um, what you were seeing at that uh, uh, storage layer there. We've actually built a storage service, uh, similar to how EBS, which is our block storage as a service used by EC2, is actually a service. You know, the, the storage itself lives outside of EC2. We did a very similar thing with Aurora. So we actually created a, a service-oriented architecture for accessing the storage. We have also made extensive use of some of uh, the other well-known AWS services like S3, Route 53, SWF, and DynamoDB for the control plane. So the control plane is basically the part of the service that actually controls the database itself. So the provisioning of the system, any metadata that we have to keep about the system, um, some of the DNS, right? You, RDS, when you uh, launch an instance, you get a, an endpoint that's all controlled by DNS, uh, and then S3 for backup and durable storage. For high availability, we've built on some of the concepts that uh, exist today with RDS uh, in multi-availability zone mode. So when you run RDS instances in multi-AZ mode today, what we're doing is we're actually making copies of your data to a second availability zone in a passive standby instance, so that if there's a service disruption in the primary availability zone, we can fail you over to the secondary, and you generally don't suffer more than, you know, 30, 60 seconds of, of downtime as the DNS switch uh, happens. So what we've done with Aurora is we've taken that uh, even further. We've decided that we're going to scale across three availability zones uh, in the regions that have three availability zones. Uh, we're going to do a four of six write forum, so every time a change is made to your data, we'll consider that change to be complete if four of the six copies have uh, completed successfully. Uh, and then on the read side, we will consider a read to be consistent if we can get three of six uh, versions of that data in that read back from the system. And there's some, some nice uh, logic in there that if an availability zone goes down, it'll automatically roll over to a three of four uh, uh, quorum model just so that your writes and reads don't completely fail simply because a single AZ is down, that really wouldn't be very smart if we wanted high availability. Uh, we're using SSDs on the back end, so that keeps read latencies really, really low uh, so that there's not a lot of seeking to pull data off disk. The database size will scale with your data, so you don't have to tell Aurora upfront how much storage you need to provision. So today with RDS, for example, if you need three terabytes of data but you're you're expecting that you'll have three terabytes six months from now, you sort of have to provision it, you know, when you launch the instance. Uh, with Aurora, you won't have to do that, right? You start with just whatever storage you're using uh, when you launch the instance, and then as you add more data to your database, we just scale the storage for you. And then the final point here, and this is, this is really 
to me, one of the most interesting pieces of it. We've, we've taken the approach of storing data in a log structured way. Uh, folks who've worked with some of the NodeSQL products like uh, HBase or Cassandra are probably familiar with log structured merge trees, which is the way those, those databases actually store their data. And we've done something similar with Aurora. Log structured storage is a well uh, researched uh, sort of uh, concept in computer science. It's not something we invented, uh, but we have implemented this for Aurora. And it has some uh, unique characteristics. So what is log structured storage? It basically just means you treat storage as a log file, right? You do append only. You don't ever actually update data. So uh, what this means is that any new uh, write of data, any new you know, piece of data that needs to be written out to storage, you just append it to the end, right? You don't actually seek for it on disk to find where the original value is, look it up, and then write it back to that uh, page. You just append it to the end. Uh, you'll use B-tree indexes to hold pointers to the latest version of a record. So uh, what will happen is when you write a new block uh, of storage or a new segment of storage, you're going to update the pointers in the index to basically point to the most recent version of that data. What this means is that you're going to end up with stale data that sort of is just orphaned. There's nothing's pointing to it, and uh, those need to be removed. And so there's a garbage collection process that will run periodically that will remove that data. So conceptually, this is what, what goes on with log structured storage. This, this isn't you know, actually how you would implement it in terms of what the data structures look like on disk, but it's just sort of what, what's going on in terms of the, uh, the indexes and the pointers. So you can see if we have a B tree index on the left there that has primary key values in it, uh, typical B tree, you know, each, each uh, uh, segment is going to point to another segment, which will eventually point to a leaf node. And uh, the leaf node there, you can see we have value 50, or a key 52 has value 1. And then we have key 55 is pointing to uh, the value for key 55. Let's just assume that the value is value 1 and value 1 in both cases. And what we have here is uh, a new value for key uh, 52. And so this just gets appended to the end of the, uh, the block of storage, right? So first, first thing that happens is just append it. Then we have to update the index. And so you can see what's happened is the new value is now referenced by the index node and the old value is stale, right? It's, it's no longer needed and there'll be this garbage collection process that actually will uh, clean it up and reclaim that space. Uh, again, for those who are familiar with Cassandra, HBase, uh, this is a lot like compaction, right? When those, those files that are being flushed to disk uh, need to be merged together uh, this type of thing is happening, right? You're actually getting rid of the old versions of records. Um, you're merging the, the files into a smaller number of files, and what you end up with are just the latest version of the records in a small number of files. So some of the, the interesting things about this are is that what this really means is that the database file itself is the write-ahead log. It is the replay log, right? As you're writing out, appending these blocks to the, to the storage, that's basically exactly what a write-ahead log does, right? So one, you're reducing I.O. because you're not having to do two writes now. You don't have to write to the write-ahead log, and then once you've written to the write-ahead log, do what you just said you were going to do in the write-ahead log, which is how database works today. And it also gives you really, really fast recovery from failure, almost instantaneous recovery, because the database file is the write-ahead log, so if there's a, a, a failure event and you restart the database, you just basically start reading from where you left off, update the pointers, and you're Covered, right? It's essentially you're replaying the log as you're reading from the database. Uh, you can also cache the writes in memory. And so what you do is you, you cache the writes in memory, uh, the buffer fills up, you flush them out of the disk, and that can happen asynchronously. And so you end up with very consistent write performance because you're writing to memory, not to storage. It also means backups are continuous and incremental. So uh, again, if every time you append a new record to the end of storage, you can also just write that segment out to say S3 or some other kind of backup media, and lo and behold, you now have continuous incremental backups, right? You, every time you write something new, you're essentially checkpointing and writing that off uh, to backup. And then there's something called multi-version concurrency control, which basically uh, data is never updated, it's only appended. So what that means is that if a read of data, what's gonna happen is the, the client's gonna request a read, the read's gonna look up the bit of data uh, using the pointers in the index, and it's going to get the c most current copy of that data at the time the read was requested. Someone could go ahead and change the data while the client's reading it, 
but that's okay, right? Because to that client, it got the most up-to-date version. And if the client then wants to write a value back out, all you need to do is on the right, just look to see, well, has the pointer changed to this value that I had in memory when I wrote it, when I read it? If the answer is yes, well, now you have a concurrency problem and you can handle it uh, optimistically as opposed to pessimistically by having to lock that data down uh, during that whole transaction, right? It doesn't mean you're gonna overwrite what somebody else has written. It just means that you can choose to do that or you can choose to reread it and then write, write out your value. So uh, that solves a lot of the scaling issues with relational databases that involve heavy use of locks because once you start locking things, uh, you know, concurrency becomes a real issue because uh, data is going to be locked for some length of time. You have lots of clients trying to access data. You know, the locks, the locks can be um, burdensome. So this, this is sort of just described in a little bit more detail, the recovery process. So, you know, in a typical database, you know, on the, on the uh, left-hand side there, um, you're going to basically have this checkpointed data and you're going to have these redo logs in the event of a, a, a failure when you have to replay the, the log. Um, if a failure occurs at T0 there, you've got to replay all of those uncommitted transactions in the log all the way up to the checkpoint. That's generally single-threaded operation. It's going to take some time to actually recover. In Aurora, because the database file is the log, and we're also splitting it up into chunks that exist on different data partitions, we actually can do sort of instantaneous uh, replays uh, across these little blocks here, and they happen in parallel. So uh, recovery from, from a failure is very, very fast. Uh, we've also done some things with the cache, so um, the query cache uh, and, and the, uh, I guess, buffer, buffer pool cache uh, are in a separate process than the, than the, than the data, database engine itself. So if you restart the database, we keep the cache warm. And so what that means is when the database is back up, uh, all of the previously cached material is still available. So you don't have to go through this process of rewarming the cache with all the queries that you're, that you're running. Some other interesting properties of the way that uh, Aurora storage uh, works is, uh, you know, with the typical read replica uh, model, you're, you're basically, um, you, you have your, your, your master here and you have your replica over here. This is 70% writes and 30% reads. So you decide, well, you know, I want to get some of those reads off my, off my primary. So you spin off a read replica and you're using, you know, in the case of MySQL, binary log replication. Well, what happens is, is that, yeah, sure, you get 30% 30, 30 new reads there. But remember, reading the, reading the binary log and, and writing that out to the replica is actually going to use resources on that instance. So you're not actually, you know, getting, you're not getting all of the compute power on that read replica devoted just to new reads. You're really only getting about 30%, right, whatever you had on the primary. Uh, with Aurora, because the, sh the storage is shared, all we need to do is just do some cache invalidation to make sure that the caching is in sync across these guys. And you actually get 100% uh, read uh, load on the replica, right? You could literally say, I want this to be 100% writes and this to be 100% reads because it's reading from the same storage. There's no, there's no log shipping going on there. So, uh, you know, you get some, some really uh, powerful scale out of this. Uh, and we give you up to 15 replicas, and there's almost no load on the master, and the lag is very, very low between the databases. This is kind of interesting. So, you know, one of, the, one of the things we've heard from customers who run RDS in multi-availability zone mode is, well, you know, multi-AZ mode is great, and sure, we trust you guys that, you know, when the primary suffers a disruption, we're, you're going to cut us over to the secondary, but you know, I've got SLAs with my customers. I don't know how long that, that's going to take. I don't know how my app is going to react. How do I simulate that? And it's like, well, how, how do you do that? And there are some tricks to do it, but there's no button that you can go into and say, hey, you know, fail over from the master to the secondary. So what we've done with Aurora is we actually created some, uh, you know, some, some DML extensions, really, or DDL, I guess, because they're altered statements, uh, that lets you actually um, simulate failures, you know, using SQL. So you can test your your failover mechanism, you can see how your application is going to behave when some of these events actually occur. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about performance, because that's one of the chief, uh, chief reasons for, for using uh, Amazon Aurora. So this, this is some performance uh, data that uh, was captured using MySQL Sysbench. 
in this case, we were running an R3 8 extra large instance that has 32 cores and 244 gigabytes of RAM. So that's the largest size instance in the R3 family, which is our memory optimized instance. And what we did was we ran four client machines. So these are actually separate EC2 instances, each with a thousand threads. Uh, and you can see that you know we got just pretty phenomenal DML here. You know, 105,000 DML per second, presumably with insert statements, right? Uh, that's significant, right? I've I've done some benchmarking with Cassandra and HBase, you know, systems that are designed, you know, to handle tens of thousands of writes per second, uh, and you know, using large EC2 instances, you know, I never saw six-figure. <laughs> transactions per second. You can definitely see 40,000, 50,000. I'm sure there are ways to get there um, with those other products, but you know, it's pretty impressive. Um, you can see that uh, we were running 4,000 4, uh, clients, so that's quite a few uh, concurrent connections as well. On the read side, same thing. We used MySQL Sys Sysbench, same instance type, R38XL. This time we did a single client with 1,000 threads, uh, and you can see just the select throughput is just you know fantastic you know half a million plus per second. You can also see that we're we're hitting the cache, right? So caching helps a lot with that. And you know reads reads tend to be the harder workload on a database, especially random access reads because it's you know it's forcing you to jump around on the disk. Obviously, solid state helps with that, but you know still uh, it's that sort of random access of data that tends to be more taxing on a database than just appending new data to the end on on writes. Replica lag, yeah, this is, a, this is an interesting one too. So you can see we did, uh, what was it, 13,800 um, you know, inserts per second, and we were seeing you know, 7.2 millisecond replica lag, right? So that's, <laughs> that's almost instantaneous. Uh, and same hardware running my SQL 5.6 um, with 2,000 updates a second was seeing replica lag around two seconds, right? So you know, your read replicas are essentially in sync with your master uh, within 10 milliseconds. This one's a little more esoteric, but you know, for people who are running databases with large numbers of tables, you can see that uh, scaling up the number of tables uh, doesn't uh, cause significant decline in database performance uh, with Aurora like it does with the other three uh, categories that we benchmarked. So uh, the first column uh, next to Aurora there is a I28XL. It's a storage optimized instance that we offer with really, really fast local SSD. And you can see that when we got to about 1,000 tables, um, you know, the, the performance really began to drop off. Uh, the same uh, MySQL instance running on an I2 with everything in RAM uh, also did suffer a drop off, particularly as you, you get down to the 10,000 tables. Uh, and then finally, an RDS MySQL using a 3,000 uh, IOPS volume or thir sorry, 30,000 IOPS volume, uh, you know, really dropped off pretty quick when we got, you know, to, to that 1,000 table range. Uh, concurrency, uh, you know, you can see Aurora, uh, as the number of connections goes up, it sort of just scales with the number of connections, uh, whereas if you look at the RDS side, you know, it, it's sort of like that 500 is, is kind of the sweet spot, and then it begins to tail off after that. So, you know, concurrency really strong on the side. Caching. Uh, this one's interesting. Uh, I need to actually talk to the guys who generated this numbers because, you know, the first, first one makes sense, right? The first, first row there, you have 100% reads and 0% writes. Aurora without caching is going to deliver 160,000 ops per second. With caching, it's 375,000. Makes sense, right? Caching is only going to help you on read. Uh, and you see similar, similar characteristic uh, with, um, well, actually, you don't, because with, with uh, for whatever reason, with with RDS, uh, MySQL, or just MySQL in general, caching is not the recommended uh, the recommended config. So it actually the, the performance goes down. With 50% read write ratio, we actually do uh, still see um, good performance on Aurora, but actually drops. And I'm guessing it has to do with the fact that it's a blended it's a blended uh, workflow, and you're just not getting as much benefit from caching. And then, of course, the final row there: 0% reads, 100% writes. Caching is not going to help you in any case. Uh, you're going to see the same performance with or without it. What I'd, what I'd like to find out just from our, our product team is, is what explains that, that you know, the, the slight drop off there. I would think that caching would, would actually make the number go up, but um, for whatever reason, it doesn't. 
could, yeah, that, that may be what it is. Yeah, yeah, the writes are causing the invalid one. Uh, read replicas, again, uh, significantly less lag than what you see uh, with just traditional MySQL. Uh, you know, on the MySQL side, as you scale up the number of transactions that are occurring on the uh, primary, you know, lag starts to go way up. You know, we don't even see the blue bars there with Aurora because we're just in the sub 10 millisecond uh, range there. So, you know, if you're doing 10,000 updates a second uh, with an RDS MySQL 30K IOPS single AZ, so we're not even having to copy the blocks to the second AZ, um, you have a 300 second uh, lag that's what, five minutes? <laughs> so, you know, that's probably not ideal unless your, you know, your clients that are talking to read replica understand there's gonna be a bunch of consistency there. Ease of use. So, you know, one of the things we like to do with all of our services is eliminate operational overhead. And we've done the same with Aurora. It's going to be part of the RDS suite of databases that you can run. So just like you can go into the RDS console, spin up a database in minutes, you'll be able to do the same thing with Aurora. Um, instant on volume snapshots. Again, you want to take a snapshot of your data, you can do it right through, right through the console, right through the API. Uh, due to that, you know, rather unique property of log structured storage, we can actually do continuous incremental off volume snapshots to S3. So, you know, again, great durability. Uh, you know, S3 designed for 11 nines of durability, not gonna lose data there, perfect place to put your backup. On the storage side, we'll scale you up to 64 terabytes, uh, and that shouldn't have any performance or availability impact. We just do it as the data size grows. I think we do it in 100 gig chunks or something like that, I forget the details there. Uh, and then under the hood at the storage layer, right, there's automatic restriping, mirror repair, hotspot management, all the things that we're doing to, to manage the actual arrays of disks that are, that are storing your data. You don't have to deal with any of that. So what, we, what we're saying is it's enter, enterprise grade features and performance at open source prices, right? Uh, enterprise features like data protection. Uh, we replicate your data across all the availability zones in the region, generally of three or more. We're doing continuous and incremental backups to S3, protect your data long term. Uh, we'll have capabilities to secure data at rest. Those are coming sometime after launch, it looks like, with AES 256 based encryption. And then all of the blocks that we're writing out to S3 will be encrypted using S3 uh, encryption, uh, presumably through the key management service, which is our, our new uh, way of doing uh, data at rest encryption using customer managed keys. Uh, SSL will be available for data in transit. So if you do have workloads involving sensitive data, compliance uh, regulations that require um, securing data in transit and at rest, we'll have SSL endpoints that you can use there. It's gonna be in VPC by default. So you know, you'll get all the extra security that you get with VPC, network ACLs, private subnets, uh, both ingress, egress rules on security groups. Uh, and then there's no direct access to the nodes. So we're not actually let customers, you know, SSH or log in to the nodes that run their Aurora database, those are all under the hood. So you'll be able to make client connections to the MySQL client, but you can't actually get in and you know, twiddle things on the nodes themselves. And, and you know, that is, uh, is an important point because uh, you know, it eliminates the likelihood that someone's gonna come in and you know, do something bad uh, by accident on your database node. Uh, engineered for mission critical apps, right? We want this to be uh, an always on database. Uh, you have 15 read replicas that you can use uh, to fail over to uh, across availability zones. Uh, if there's a service disruption in an availability zone, it's designed to handle it completely transparently. So you shouldn't even see you know, a, 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 a brief sort of disruption while the failover occurs, right? Um, immediate crash recovery, again, that's one of the sort of interesting properties of log structured storage is that you, know, you don't have this period of time where you're having to, a lengthy period of time potentially where you're replaying uh, redo logs or write ahead logs. Uh, and then uh, the page cache, we keep it warm in the event that the database engine itself needs to be restarted. So uh, when you come back up, you have all the benefits of, of the cache. And finally, the pricing, right? This is what sort of <laughs> makes it uh, as really as compelling as it can be. Uh, you can see that we start with the R3 large instance type at 29 cents an hour, and that goes up to 464 an hour with the R3 8 extra large. That's pretty inexpensive. I, I don't remember offhand what the R3 8 extra large EC2 hourly price is. Probably not that much more than $4.64 an hour. So 
Uh, these are uh, what we expect the prices to be for Virginia. So there may be some variability across regions, right? You know, our costs do vary across the different geographic regions that we operate in around the world. So there'll be some differentiation there. But uh, you know, for Virginia, this is what we're saying. Um, there's also uh, some cost for the storage. Storage will be 10 cents per gigabyte per month. Uh, and then uh, you'll pay 20 cents per million pounds. Targeted launch for this uh, second quarter of this year. So no, no specific date yet, but uh, that's what we're targeting. And there is a, a preview now. I don't know uh, offhand um, if they're still accepting new customers into it, but we'll see. It's something we can look into. Uh, and just a shout out to the dev team, right? We just want everybody to know that this is a, a huge effort on our part, right? You know, we do we launch a lot of services, a lot of features throughout the year, and and you know, we've got a lot of people that work really hard on these. Uh, this is a big one, right? This is one that significant amount of engineering went into it. Uh, it's been in the works for uh, a while, so um, nice work by the dev team. And that's it. <laughs>